Toyota's Tacoma is an automotive conundrum. Even though this generation of Tacoma dates back to 2015, large portions of the vehicle actually date back to 2005, making this one of the oldest vehicles on sale in the United States. But despite that, this is the fourth best-selling truck in America, the fourth best-selling Toyota in America, and last year it had its best sales year ever, selling over 252,000 units, making this in the top 10 of absolutely anything that has wheels and is sold in America. Without question, the Tacoma is the benchmark by which all other trucks in North America must be measured. But interestingly, when you do that measurement, most of the competition comes out ahead of the Tacoma in a lot of key ways, like cabin comfort, cabin roominess, tech, fuel economy, and even off-road capability. Yet the Tacoma continues to dominate the sales charts, and it will likely continue when we see the new model either late this year or early next year. So while we wait for that next generation Tacoma to come along, let's take a look at what's made this model such a sales success, why you might want one, and why you might want one of those others, again, by which this must always be measured. It's now time for a bit of history. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Toyota started feeling that North American shoppers had different tastes than pickup truck shoppers around the world, in Europe, in Japan, etc. So they decided to start developing a truck specifically for the North American market. And this ended up replacing the Toyota Hilux, which was being sold as the Toyota pickup truck. 1995 was the first year for the Tacoma in America. They said that the reason for that was the diverging missions of these two vehicles and the diverging tastes in these two markets. Supposedly, the Tacoma was designed to focus on ride quality, on-road handling, on-road comfort, and safety over the rugged mission, off-road mission, and payload mission that we find in the Toyota Hilux. Now, interesting twist for that, of course, is fast forward to 2022, and a large portion of the reason to buy the Tacoma is, of course, its rugged mission, its off-road capability in TRD and TRD Pro models, although payload, that's still on the low side. According to the official spec, payload in the Tacoma could range from 1,050 pounds on up to 1,685 pounds, but remember that dealer-installed and factory-installed accessories will lower your payload capacity. So this model, as equipped, comes in at just 900 pounds of payload. That is certainly lower than a number of the key competition. Towing capacity is also a little bit below the competition. It ranges from 3,500 to 6,800 pounds, and most of the models on dealer lots will tow between 64 and 6,500 pounds. Expect both of those numbers to change significantly for the next generation of Tacoma that we should be seeing this year or next year. From the rumor mills that I have been party to, expect payload to definitely be competitive with the segment, so expect over 1,500 pounds in most models. I would expect about a 500 pound bump for most of the versions of Tacoma, and expect towing to go up to probably around 7,500 pounds at least. We don't know what's going to be under the hood, but let's dive under there in this generation now. As this generation of Tacoma rolls off into the sunset, it does so with two different naturally aspirated engines. The 2.7 liter four cylinder producing 159 horsepower, not a lot of power for a mid-sized truck, or this 3.5 liter V6, which is sometimes derided as the minivan V6, producing 278 horsepower and 265 pound-feet of torque. They send power to the ground via a six-speed automatic transmission, or if you get the TRD Off-Road or TRD Pro, you can get a six-speed manual. Now, if you want a naturally aspirated V6 engine in your next Toyota truck, you're probably gonna wanna get one of these because the next generation is probably gonna end up with a turbocharged engine under the hood. That's a transition that we're starting to see Toyota make across the lineup, including Lexus, so my personal expectation is that we'll end up seeing a 2.4 liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine under this hood in the next generation. Exactly what we see, however, that's anyone's guess because Toyota has not said anything publicly, but they have said that there probably will be an electric Tacoma, and you can bet that there's probably going to be a hybrid Tacoma as well. Poor fuel economy continues to be a pain point for Tacoma shoppers, although I expect that to change in a big way for the next generation. But as it is, this model's most efficient format is gonna be the base engine, rear wheel drive, just 159 horsepower, and only 21 miles per gallon combined. There are a decent number of half-ton trucks that will match or exceed that 21 miles per gallon combined with either V6 engines, turbocharged engines, or even V8 engines. And the least efficient version of this generation Tacoma could get as low as 18 miles per gallon combined if you get the off-road flavors. 
I've always had a bit of a problem with the ergonomics of this generation Tacoma because the seat bottom cushion is quite low to the ground and the body is fairly short in terms of its height versus the competition. The result is that at six feet tall, I feel like I am sitting here driving with my arms straight out in front of me and my legs straight out in front of me as well. It's not an overly comfortable position. The steering wheel does not come out terribly far. It really only moves maybe about three quarters of an inch. So this could be a little better maybe if the steering wheel came out a little bit, but as it is, it's a little unusual. Now this model does not have the moonroof, so I could lift the seat up a little bit, but the front of the seat bottom cushion does not come up terribly far. So that just presents a uh, slightly different ergonomic challenge as far as getting a comfortable driving position. Jumping into the back, we find a seat bottom cushion that's slightly higher off the floor than the front seats, so I find this a little bit more comfortable for my legs, but the result of that is we have less headroom. I can't actually put my head back there to the headrest without craning my head to the side. And again, this one does not have the moonroof option. We do have kind of a bowl-shaped ceiling, which means that we get a little bit less clearance for heads over here on the outboard seating positions. Pretty average room for a mid-sized truck here in the middle. I can actually put my head almost back there to the headrest here. And then if I try and move over to the right side, you'll definitely find less combined legroom in here than we find in the newest of the General Motors mid-sized trucks. Even trucks that are smaller than the Tacoma, like the new Ford Maverick, which is a decent amount smaller than this, actually have a bit more seat comfort as far as rear seat passengers go. The rear seats feature a 60-40 design. You can fold the seat bottom cushion up, access storage compartments under the seat, and then you can also flip the seat back forward so you can have a flat load floor in here. Toyota gives that seat a practical plastic back. There's a small storage cubby behind the seat back cushion, and you can see that storage compartment right there under the seats. Now, one thing worth noting is that the seat belts are not rigid, so they do end up hiding under that seat bottom cushion from time to time. The place where the Tacoma is really starting to show its age is the interior. Some features are divorced from one another, so for instance, the gear shift is down there, but some of the off-road controls like the rear locker and some of the all-terrain controls, they're gonna be up here. We don't have a moonroof in this particular trim. This is an SR5 trim, but if we take a look back there in the rear, we do have a powered rear window, which is a nice touch. Driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, two-way adjustable headrests, and fairly attractive upholstery. Obviously, Toyota has kept the upholstery more modern. We have fairly flat seats, front and rear, and very low to the floor. That is my big complaint about the Tacoma. I find the front seats to be particularly uncomfortable, mainly because of the seating position. Moving over to the front doors, we find some soft touch materials there, plenty of hard plastics though, those are gonna help improve durability. We then find lots of hard plastics on the dashboard as well. Hard touch upper section of the dash, soft touch midsection, just this section right here, and then hard plastics lower on the dash as well. We have a slot style glove compartment. It is absolutely enormous, very, very tall. So you can definitely put things like shoe boxes in there if you wanted to do that. In the middle of the dashboard, we have one of the few updates that the interior has had over time. This is one of the more recent Toyota infotainment systems, but not the absolute latest, as you can see. There's factory navigation available, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. And then below that, we find a teeny tiny little LCD for the automatic climate control. This is a two zone automatic climate control system with a little auto button right there. To the left of the climate controls, we find the electronic control for the four wheel drive system, two high, four high, and four low only. So no four auto mode. I would love to see that in a mid-sized truck. Over here, we have an actual key. It's one of those remote integrated keys. We don't have keyless start on this model. Down here, we have the blind spot monitoring button, ECT power button, something that we don't really see in Toyota models, generally speaking anymore. Parking sensor disable and enable button. It's a little cover right there over the USB port. We have a 12 volt power port, place for you to store your phones, two pretty decently sized cup holders. If I can actually hold this down while I'm holding onto the camera here, park, reverse, drive it, hops and bops along there and then goes back to park. There's no unlock button because of the gated nature of that shifter. Then we have another cup holder back here, still have a handbrake, padded center armrest, it's kind of rubbery there. And then we open it up to find a pretty decently sized storage compartment with two USB charge only ports there. There's actually a USB-C port inside. Moving over to the driver's side, we find a mostly analog instrument cluster with a small approximately four inch color LCD right there in the middle. Moving out from there, we find a four spoke steering wheel, basically Toyota's truck steering wheel for ages and ages here. Thumb grips up top, infotainment controls over here on the left side, and then controls for that teeny tiny little LCD over there on the right side. Cruise control is on a stock, it turns with the steering wheel, then there's some extra buttons down here at the bottom, because of course we get the Toyota Safety Sense package standard on the Tacoma, and that is really a great option because 
Radar Adaptive Cruise Control hasn't really been available on most of the competition, and even if it is, it's quite expensive. Here it is not. Moving over to the other side, we have the auto headlight button, button to turn on and off that cargo light right there, and then the onboard inverter in the 400 watt mode and 100 watt mode. You can see they're indicated right there. Get the Tacoma out on the road, and there is certainly a lot of engine noise under acceleration, but not a lot of acceleration. This model went zero to 60 in 7.7 .7 seconds. That's just one tenth of a second faster than the last model I tested, which was a limited trim with the nightshade package. And that's likely because this SR5 is a little bit lighter. Obviously you'll probably go zero to 60 just a hair faster in the rear wheel drive model as well. And if you choose the base engine, well, acceleration is probably going to be glacial. Expect those times to be well over nine seconds, zero to 60. 60 to zero stopping distance, pretty typical for a pickup truck, 130 38 feet in this model. Remember that as far as grip goes, there's not that much difference between a mid-sized truck and a half-ton truck on the lower end of that half-ton scale. So 60 to zero stopping distances are not going to be enormously different. As we roll through the comparisons, I'm mainly going to be talking generically about pickups, regardless of their size category, because there is so much overlap with pickup trucks in America. The longest version of this Toyota Tacoma is over 220 inches long, so that's actually longer than the shortest half-ton trucks in America, the regular cab, Ram 1500, Silverado, etc. So there's certainly going to be a lot of cross-shopping overlap. Pricing also has a big overlap between this and those half-ton options. When it comes to handling, a lot of the half-ton trucks will feel a little bit better out on the road, a little bit newer, a little bit more nimble. This has a pretty isolated steering rack, although the handling is fairly precise. I'm gonna give this a B as far as absolute grip goes, because again, there's not an enormous amount of difference between these options. If you were interested in better handling, better ride, etc., then you're probably going to want to take a look at the trucks that are smaller than this. The Santa Cruz definitely has a sharp handling feel to it. The Maverick's not half bad either, but they're not the same kind of truck as this, of course, even though you could logically cross shop the one against the other. Those are certainly going to be easier to park than this, and they're going to be more crossover with a bed grafted on the back. So depending on exactly what you're looking for, you should definitely keep that distinction in mind. This certainly feels like a traditional truck out on the road, and it's rear wheel drive only when you're driving out on the road, because this is a part-time four wheel drive system. You should only be engaging four high in slick situations, not on wet pavement either. It needs to be icy, snowy, gravelly, dirty, that kind of thing. If you put this in four high, you'll actually notice that the handling ability and the stress on the transmission uh, are gonna be changed. So handling ability is gonna go down, stress on the drivetrain components is gonna go up. So that's why you should not be using four high out on regular paved road surfaces. For some reason, the engineers at Toyota are still really resisting giving their mainstream vehicles full-time four-wheel drive systems like we do find in some of their more expensive off-road vehicles, or of course, the Lexus product line. I think a full-time four-wheel drive system would be an excellent entry in this segment. You do find full-time four-wheel drive systems in American trucks, but for some reason, not the import trucks at this time. Out on a rougher road like the one that I'm on here, I'm going to give ride quality a B plus. This is pretty similar to the ride quality that you'll experience in basically every mid-sized truck. Although the smaller trucks that we find in America are going to give you a more compliant ride. The Santa Cruz, the Maverick, etc. They are going to be more comfortable. But versus the Frontier and the Ranger, this is pretty similar. I do find the Gladiator a little bit more comfortable, likely because of its more off-road mission. As you'd expect, ride quality is going to vary based on the trim level you select and the wheel and tire options that come on that trim level. Out on the open road at 50 miles an hour, I measured 74 decibels in here, definitely making this louder than the average half-ton truck. I was surprised that this is not that much quieter than the TRD versions of the Tacoma, and I think it's just down to the platform age. There is certainly less sound deadening going on in here. And out on this particular road surface at higher speeds, you'll also notice part of my complaint about the ride quality in this and really every other mid-sized truck. It's just not as civilized as the average half-ton truck either. You'll certainly notice I'm moving around more here in this cabin over these minor road imperfections, and those minor road imperfections definitely upset this suspension more than something like a Toyota Tundra. So if you want a better riding truck, you actually want to go up in the lineup. You don't want to go down. I wouldn't be surprised if that also changes for the next generation model. If you're a frequent viewer, then you'll notice that the last time I reviewed the Tacoma, I gave it an A- minus when it came to fuel economy as compared to other mid-sized trucks. All the mid-sized trucks are fairly low in America. 
but I have to say I'm going to give this a C minus now because we do find some really efficient base entries in half ton competition and we also have the new Maverick and the Santa Fe, especially the Maverick. The Maverick comes standard with the hybrid system. Not only is it significantly less expensive than this, it has a payload rating that's around this Toyota Tacoma. It's not going to tow as much. The tow rating in that hybrid model is pretty low, but you can get the towing up to 4,000 pounds if you get the turbo model and that turbocharged model is still going to be way more efficient than this. Of course, if you get the hybrid, it's going to easily be getting over 30 miles per gallon with the convenience of the bed in the back, decent ride, comfortable cabin, etc. It honestly does not feel as premium as the Tacoma on the inside. It has a lot of really hard plastics. Plastics in here are actually a little bit better even though this is older. But remember the price tag. That's going to be about seven to $8,000 less expensive if you are lucky enough to have pre-ordered one. If you weren't and you're getting a 2023, then obviously it's going to be more expensive. And of course, they are completely sold out because honestly, it's a pretty good little truck. So your alternative currently, if you want to actually get your hands on one, would be something like the Santa Fe. It's still going to be more efficient than this. All the Delta does close up a little bit. Bottom line, out on the road, the Tacoma has aged relatively well. It feels just like you would expect a small pick up truck to feel. It's not going to be as refined as the more expensive trucks, but the price tag is fairly low. And it certainly goes with the sort of rough and tumble rugged mission that a lot of Tacoma shoppers have in mind when they're thinking about a Tacoma as their next truck. At the end of the day, the Tacoma is rugged, reliable, attractive, and has good resale value. It's also not terribly expensive. Base versions of this start around $27,000, definitely less expensive than some of the competition, especially the off-road rugged competition like the Jeep Gladiator. That does get very, very expensive. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, a lot of the competition will excel over the Tacoma in a number of key ways. Off-road ability is certainly one of them. If you're interested in that, you're going to want a Gladiator Rubicon. It will definitely blow a Tacoma out of the water when it comes to off-road ability. Now, it's not going to do so well when it comes to dependability or reliability, but oddly enough, resale value has been pretty good in the Gladiator as well. If you're interested in turbocharged power, you'll find that in the new General Motors pickup trucks. If you want something that's perhaps a little bit more fleet oriented, a little bit less expensive to buy, that's going to be the Ford Ranger. They have some pretty inexpensive models with that 2.3 liter turbocharged engine under the hood and an excellent 10 speed automatic. I really like the Ranger, but it's not as attractive as this, oddly enough. It may be more comfortable inside. It may have better payload numbers and better towing numbers, but it's not as attractive, probably not as reliable or dependable either. Then we have the Nissan Frontier, a solid option if you're looking for an inexpensive truck with a naturally aspirated engine and a regular automatic transmission. But they don't have the dependability reliability mission that we have over here in this. The Frontier is selling relatively well, but to be honest, I probably would get something like a Tacoma over the Frontier, especially if you're at all concerned about those long-term reliability numbers. It does use a Mercedes transmission, and how reliable that will be long-term, we just don't know. There are, of course, a ton of other reasons why the Tacoma has been selling well. Obviously, Toyota dealers have a good reputation for not being quite as sleazy, I guess we should just say, as the rest of the competition out there. Obviously, that bodes well for the Tacoma and for its replacement. I'm really intrigued to see what Toyota does for that next generation Tacoma. Will it really be electrified in some format right from launch? Will it have a turbocharged engine? Will they be sticking with a new naturally aspirated engine or just the same old minivan engine that we find in this? Are they finally going to be giving us a 10-speed automatic transmission. All those details will be known soon, but if you're asking for my prediction, I suspect it's going to have a 10-speed automatic transmission, probably the same one that we find in the Tundra and in the Sequoia. Likely some form of that electrification going on, so some form of hybrid, probably with the 2.4-liter turbocharged engine that we find spreading across a wide variety of different Toyota models. That would probably be a really good fit power-wise for this and put it in direct competition with most of the alternatives available in North America. What we probably will not see is a naturally aspirated V6 engine in that next generation Tacoma, although I could be wrong there. But Toyota does not have a design that I think would fit in line with the rest of the competition as far as power outputs go. They could continue the 3.5 liter V6, but fuel economy is not exactly its forte in this truck. Hopefully that is going to change in a big way. I would not be surprised if we saw Finally, a Tacoma with over 25 miles per gallon combined for the next generation. Hopefully higher, but we'll know a little bit later this year or perhaps early 2023. In the meantime, be sure and hit that subscribe button down there. Check out all the related videos that you'll find on the channel, including a detailed review of the closely related Toyota 4Runner, which we should also see a next generation of sometime in the next calendar year. I'll see all of you later.